The year was 1953, and deep inside MIT's Lincoln Laboratory, a young engineer named Jay Forrester stared at a wall-sized computer that kept failing at the worst possible moments. The machine was designed to track Soviet bombers that might be racing toward American cities, but its memory, built from fragile vacuum tubes, couldn't be trusted for more than a few hours at a time. In the tense atmosphere of the Cold War, where split-second decisions could mean the difference between safety and catastrophe, this wasn't just inconvenient, it was terrifying. Forrester knew that somewhere in the tangle of wires and tubes before him lay a problem that could reshape the entire future of computing. What he didn't know was that his solution would eventually touch everything from nuclear submarines to lunar landers, and ultimately, the smartphone you're probably holding right now. Imagine trying to remember something important, but every time you blink, there's a chance you'll forget it entirely. That's essentially what early computers faced. The ENIAC, that legendary room-sized calculator from the 1940s, used vacuum tubes for memory, glowing glass bottles that generated intense heat and burned out with alarming regularity. Other systems tried mercury delay lines, where information literally traveled as sound waves through tubes of toxic liquid mercury. These memories were slow, unreliable, and maddeningly expensive. Engineers joked grimly that you needed one technician for every hundred vacuum tubes just to keep replacing the ones that failed. For military applications, where a computer might need to track dozens of aircraft simultaneously while operating on a ship being tossed by ocean waves, these systems were essentially useless. But Forrester had an idea that seemed almost absurdly simple. What if, instead of storing bits as electrical charges or sound waves, you could store them as tiny magnets? He envisioned a grid of small magnetic rings, each one barely bigger than a seed bead, threaded with impossibly thin wires. By sending electrical pulses through these wires, you could flip each ring's magnetic field one way or the other, essentially creating a physical switch that represented a one or a zero. The beauty of this approach was that once you set a ring's magnetic state, it stayed that way, even if you turned off the power. The memory was persistent, it was stable. And unlike those temperamental vacuum tubes, it didn't care if you shook it, heated it, or left it alone for years. The problem was making it work. Each tiny ferrite clinger needed to be threaded with three or four wires, each thinner than a human hair, passing through a hole less than a millimeter wide. Forrester and his team spent months figuring out the physics, the materials, and the geometry. They tested hundreds of different magnetic materials, trying to find one with just the right properties. It needed to switch states quickly, hold its magnetism reliably, and not interfere with neighboring cores. When they finally got a small prototype working, the implications were immediately clear. This wasn't just an improvement over existing memory, it was a revolution. Core memory, as it came to be called, was faster, more reliable, more compact, and more resilient than anything that had come before. The first major application was the very system that had frustrated Forrester in the first place, SAGE, the semi-automatic ground environment. This was America's answer to the bomber threat. A network of massive computers spread across the continent, all working together to create a real-time picture of North American airspace. Each SAGE computer used core memory to track aircraft, predict trajectories, and coordinate defensive responses. For the first time, operators could sit at a console with a display screen, point at a blip representing an unknown aircraft, and instantly call up information about its speed, heading, and identity. The system worked because core memory could store and retrieve information in milliseconds, reliably, day after day, without the constant maintenance headaches of vacuum tube memory.
when SAGE became operational in the late 1950s, it represented the largest computer project ever attempted, and core memory was its beating heart. But the military saw other possibilities. Nuclear submarines, those silent hunters prowling beneath the waves, needed navigation computers that could calculate their position without surfacing to see the stars. These computers had to work in cramped, humid spaces while being subjected to the constant vibration of engines and the occasional shock of depth charges. Core memory was perfect for this environment. It didn't mind the moisture, it wasn't bothered by vibration, and it kept working even when the power flickered. By the early 1960s, American submarines were using navigation computers built around core memory, giving them an unprecedented ability to stay submerged for months while knowing exactly where they were. Soviet submarines, lacking this technology, couldn't match their operational flexibility. Then came the space race, and core memory found its most dramatic proving ground. When President Kennedy declared that America would land a man on the moon before the decade was out, NASA faced an extraordinary challenge. They needed to build a computer that could fit inside a spacecraft, barely larger than a closet, survive the violence of a rocket launch, operate in the vacuum of space where temperature swings between hundreds of degrees, and never ever fail at a critical moment. The Apollo Guidance Computer, designed by MIT's Instrumentation Laboratory, used core memory as its foundation. Engineers hand-wove the memory modules, threading 72,000 tiny ferrite cores with wire so fine it could barely be seen. Each core represented one bit of information, and together they stored the programs that would navigate to the moon, control the descent to its surface, and bring the astronauts home. Picture Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin in the lunar module Eagle, descending toward the Sea of Tranquility in July 1969. The computer is flashing alarm codes. It's being overwhelmed with radar data. Mission Control in Houston, 10,000 miles away, has seconds to decide whether to abort the landing or trust the core memory to hold the essential programs while shedding unnecessary tasks. They trust the memory. The landing proceeds. Armstrong takes manual control for the final moments, but the core memory has guided them to within meters of their target, navigating through space with calculations stored in tiny magnetic rings. When the lunar module's engines fire for the return to orbit, when the command module's engine burns to leave lunar orbit, when the spacecraft aligns itself for re-entry into Earth's atmosphere, every calculation depends on those hand-woven cores working flawlessly. They do. The astronauts come home. Core memory has worked perfectly in an environment that would have destroyed any previous memory technology. What made core memory so revolutionary wasn't just its reliability, though that was crucial. It was the unique combination of properties that made it suitable for almost any application. It was non-volatile, meaning data persisted without power, essential for systems that might experience power interruptions. It was random access, meaning you could read any bit of information just as quickly as any other, unlike tape or drum memory where you had to wait for the right spot to rotate into position. It was radiation hard, unaffected by the cosmic rays that could flip bits in later semiconductor memories. And it was manufacturable at scale. Companies like IBM devoted entire factories to producing core memory, employing thousands of workers, mostly women, who had the dexterity and patience to thread those impossibly fine wires through tiny ferrite rings. At its peak in the mid-1960s, core memory production was one of America's largest electronics manufacturing operations. The technology spread everywhere. Commercial airlines used core memory in their reservation systems, creating the first real-time booking networks where agents could instantly see seat availability across hundreds of flights. Banks used it for automated teller systems and check processing. Weather forecasters used it for climate modeling computers that could process satellite data. Manufacturing plants used it for numerical control machines that could cut metal parts with unprecedented precision. By 1970, if you used any kind of automated system, whether you were withdrawing cash, booking a flight, or watching a computer-guided machine tool, there was a good chance that core memory was involved somewhere in the process. 
But even as core memory was reaching its zenith of success, its obsolescence was already being engineered in Silicon Valley. Semiconductor memory, memory built from transistors etched onto silicon chips, was faster, consumed less power, and most importantly, was getting exponentially cheaper every year. Gordon Moore's famous observation that the number of transistors on a chip doubled roughly every two years meant that semiconductor memory was on an inexorable cost curve downward. Core memory, no matter how optimized, still required human hands to thread those wires. It couldn't scale the same way. By the mid-1970s, the writing was on the wall. New computer designs began using semiconductor RAM. The last major computer to use core memory was probably built in the early 1980s. The technology that had dominated computing for two decades disappeared in less than 10 years. Yet, core memory's legacy runs deeper than most people realize. The very vocabulary of modern computing bears its imprint. We still talk about core memories and core dumps. When a program crashes and saves its memory state to disk, that's called a core dump, a term that made literal sense when memory was actually made of magnetic cores. The concept of reliable, fast, random access memory that core memory pioneered became the foundation for every computer architecture that followed. The lessons learned in manufacturing core memory about precision assembly, quality control and testing transferred directly to semiconductor manufacturing. Many of the engineers who built the first semiconductor memories had cut their teeth debugging core memory systems. And here's something most people don't know. Core memory's unique properties mean it's still used in a few specialized applications today. Some spacecraft still carry core memory modules because they're immune to radiation-induced errors that can plague semiconductor memory in deep space. Certain military systems maintain core memory because it's virtually impossible to hack remotely. There's no electronic signal you can transmit that will change the magnetic state of a physical ferrite core. It's the ultimate air-gapped memory. Some museums and vintage computer enthusiasts have even begun manufacturing small quantities of new core memory, recreating the manufacturing techniques that once employed thousands the smartphone in your pocket contains memory that's billions of times more compact than core memory, millions of times faster, and costs a tiny fraction as much. But that smartphone exists because core memory proved that reliable, fast, random access storage was possible. It demonstrated that computers could be trusted with critical tasks. It enabled the software revolution by giving programmers enough memory to write complex programs. Every app you use, every photo you store, every message you send exists in a direct line of descent from those tiny magnetic cores that Jay Forrester and his team painstakingly developed in the 1950s. Think about that the next time you're navigating with GPS, which descended from those submarine navigation systems. Consider it when you see footage of space launches, knowing that the same principles that guided Apollo still guides some satellites today. Remember it when you book a flight online, using systems that evolved from those core memory reservation computers. The technology itself may be obsolete, but its fingerprints are everywhere. The story of magnetic core memory is ultimately a story about the invisible infrastructure that shapes our world. We live in an age where memory is so cheap and abundant that we barely think about it. Your phone probably has more memory than all the computers in the world combined had in 1960. But someone had to figure out how to make reliable memory in the first place. Someone had to solve the problem of storing information that wouldn't vanish when the power flickered, that could survive vibration and temperature swings that could be read and written fast enough to keep up with human needs. Forrester and his colleagues solved that problem with tiny rings of ferrite and impossibly thin wires. And in doing so, they helped create the world we inhabit today. 
So here's to the forgotten technology that won the Cold War, landed humans on the moon, and paved the way for the digital revolution. Here's to the thousands of workers who threaded millions of cores by hand, creating memory modules with their skill and patience. Here's to magnetic core memory, a technology so successful that it made itself obsolete by proving what was possible. Without it, computers might have remained room-sized curiosities, too unreliable for critical tasks, too limited for complex software. With it, we learned that machines could remember, could be trusted, and could change everything. And that's exactly what happened.